you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoy this uh, video. Um, it makes uh, looking ECAP to be already a mature product, but in reality, ECAP is starting today. So I welcome all the guests, the colleagues and the friends uh, to this event. I'm extremely pleased to announce the beginning of the International Knowledge Hub Against Plastic Pollution and the opening of the website ecap.org that is now online. So ECAP is the home of an international community of scientists and experts that works independently and free of conflicts of interest towards solution for plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is a landmark of our epoch. During the last seven decades, about 8 billion tons of plastic have been produced, most of which lays down in the world's landfills or mixed with other types of waste, or actually worse, they have been released to the environment. Plastic pollution affects biodiversity and ecosystem integrity. It has been documented that more than 700 species of organisms has been uh, uh, having some form of interaction with plastic, some of them even life-threatening. Also, socioeconomic systems are deeply impacted by plastic pollution. It has been estimated that plastic pollution causes a loss in marine ecosystem service delivery between 0 0.5 and $2.5 trillion annually. Plastic pollution, of course, can directly affect quality of life and uh, uh, health of uh, people around the world, especially the most vulnerable group in developing countries. So succeeding in defeating plastic pollution is a key step on the way to fulfill the global sustainable development goals. We believe that science shall play a key role in analyzing and documenting uh, determinants and consequences of pollution and also in identifying workable solutions. Being a scientist in this historical moment demands a strong commitment towards finding solutions and a proactive attitude to convey this solution to policymakers and innovators in different sectors. We believe that in order to uh, advise the society, our community of scientists and experts should organize the existing and new developed knowledge into a single cohesive, clear and authoritative voice that can be effectively assimilated by policymakers and innovators. For this, we created ECAP and its website. I take the chance now to, to share my screen to show you um, some uh, page of our new, yes, our new website. Give me one second. Yes, you can, uh, you can see the ECAP uh, at this uh, address, ecap.org. Uh, ECAP hosts a knowledge hub uh, where starting from today, we will start uh, collecting, uh, reviewing, highlighting important scientific advances and findings. And we report success stories of plastic pollution fight. The site illustrates, of course, our identity, our mission, um, it also organizes knowledges in three uh, thematic areas, the, uh, the environment, society, and technology. ECAP community will continue receiving in the coming days and years contribution from selected studies and particularly interesting initiative uh, that represent important milestones on the path towards carbon plastic pollution. These stories will be organized uh, in a specific section of the website that call the stories or scientific highlights, and will also be an opportunity to give to their authors a great deal of visibility. Uh, the website also uh, include a database, we call it library, that collect records of uh, selected impactful uh, research work. So we are at the beginning of filling up this database. Beyond the research uh, papers, it also hosts a collection, will host a collection of policy documents or report uh, taken from the gray literature that are not readily available or accessible through uh, normal scientific search engines. So please do not miss the opportunity 
to visit uh, our website. So this welcome today is also an invitation to all the scientists and experts present in this webinar uh, and those that share the same ambition, mission and will to give a contribution to the society to join this community and help us uh, to turn ECAP into a successful and impactful story. ECAP is meant to be a democratic organization equally contributed by its members, independent, free of conflict of interest, devoted to engage with the societal actors and policymakers. We will organize thematic conferences and webinars, such as the one that will follow today. We will also release an important overarching publication, including, for example, proceedings, and we are aiming to work on developing global or regional status reports covering different aspects of plastic pollution. Um, so our mission, a mission of this community is to grow, uh, to make ECAP an important instrument in the hands of scientists to help humanity to get rid of plastic pollution. Welcome everyone and enjoying this first thematic conference on a very important topic indeed the role of the informal waste management sector in combating pollution. Please make uh, ECAP your home and your mission by joining and contributing to this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Luca. Um, now I'll uh, pass the word on to Jeroen uh, Nussum. Um, please uh, um, go ahead uh, with your opening remarks uh, on this webinar. Thank you so much and thank you for the introduction and opportunity at least to share a few reflections and thoughts and on the opening of this seminar. I think the title speaks for itself and I even think we can leave out the question mark. Yes, the informal sector is extremely important and yes, important issues around the informal sector has been ignored. More than 3 billion people globally depend on the ocean for their livelihoods. Clean and healthy oceans are particularly important for food security with an increasing pollution. The health of our oceans and environment are being contested by waste and plastic pollution. And in the next 20 years, plastic waste generation will double and plastic leakage to the ocean will nearly triple. So clearly there is an urgent need for collective international action. The second session of UN Environmental Assembly in February next year will be a crucial venue where we can take collective action on plastic pollution. The Norwegian Development Programme to combat marine litter and microplastics was established three years ago. We aim to prevent and significantly reduce marine litter from large sources in developing countries. Improving waste management is a priority in the programme. And many of our partners, including NIVA, are working with informal sector as this sector is important for waste management in partner countries. More than half of all plastic that is being recycled worldwide is collected through informal waste sector. And there are 15 to 20 million people working in this sector. And this sector, as all other sectors, was hit hard by the pandemic in many places, by lockdown, losing of income, risk of diseases, and often outside social safety nets and security. What we learn from our partners is that it is important that this sector is not ignored when a new global instrument is being developed. To build on the strengths of the informal sector, recognize this is important and build on those practices that are safe for workers and the environment. In Southeast Asia, 90% of plastic bottles are collected through the informal sector. And the informal sector is an important actor, but it is also an actor that lacks recognition in many, many places. And this is also why it's so important to build knowledge around the role of the informal sector and to increase awareness. And I'm th therefore very pleased to congratulate you on launching the International Knowledge Hub, ECAP, where this topic, as well as other topics relevant to the challenge of plastic pollution will be covered. Congratulations. There is a clear need for collective action on marine litter, and we are encouraged to see the large number of countries that are supporting the move on this agenda. We highly, highly appreciate that NIVA has taken initiative to discuss the role of the informal sector in a future international instrument on plastic pollution. 
And I look forward to learn more from experiences with the informal ways in India and how informal sector is included in the Minamata Convention. Thank you so much for the intention. Good luck with this seminar and thanks again for being invited. I wish you all a good webinar and rich discussions on these engaging issues. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Johan, for the encouragement. And um, we, of course, look very much forward to working together with NUDAT uh, on these issues uh, that you also just outlined, including when it comes to EUNIA 5. Um, yes, and so let's proceed now to the um, expert um, session, um, where we will start with um, Erland uh, Dragnat from the Ministry of Climate and Environment. Uh, Erland. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Hans. Let me just uh, start by sharing my screen here. <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Dragit. I work at the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Norway. Uh, I've been asked to uh, to say a few words about um, what a global uh, agreement to prevent plastic pollution uh, could look like and why it's important. Um, just uh, to start us off, I just wanted to um, uh, reference uh, the Norwegian uh, leading role in, in getting this topic on the global environmental agenda. Uh, at the first United Nations Environmental Assembly in 2014, uh, Norway um, uh, took the first uh, step uh, in uh, identifying this as an emerging issue uh, with the first resolution on marine litter uh, in uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly. Consequently, we've, uh, we've had four uh, resolutions um, in the subsequent uh, uh, four years, uh, with knowledge generating um, between each uh, session. Uh, and we now come to the point uh, where uh, three fourths uh, of all UN member states uh, believe it's uh, important to start negotiations uh, towards a global agreement to prevent plastic pollution which is, uh, just gives you an, uh, an, uh, an overview of how quickly uh, this issue uh, has uh, become uh, on the top of the global environmental agenda. Uh, and uh, at the next uh, session of the UN Environment Assembly, uh, we hope to uh, take a decision to start negotiations um, towards a global agreement. So it's very pertinent to start uh, to to also lift uh, lift up and identify the the, the relevant issues to uh, groups uh, vulnerable groups uh, that may be impacted by such an agreement, and ensure that they have a voice uh, and that the agreement is designed in a way that also um, uh, provides a, a just transition. Uh, in in this context, but uh, to start us uh, to start with uh, the question posed to me, uh, I'd like to start uh, start on on why we think a global agreement is important. So that uh, is, um, we argue that uh, that a transboundary environmental problem such as plastic pollution. Um, ending up in, in all uh, environmental compartments, not only um, uh, the oceans, uh, requires a global solution. Additionally, as Jürgen also pointed to, uh, estimations show that we are looking at um, a projected growth uh, of uh, a double amount of plastic production um, taking place over the next 20 years. Uh, which will uh, ultimately lead to a doubling of, uh, of plastic waste being generated uh, if we don't see uh, more urgent actions uh, taking place both nationally, regionally, as well as globally. And uh, through, through this process of uh, identifying the, the sources of marine, uh, of plastic pollution going into the oceans and and uh, understanding uh, 
the measures that we need to take, um, it's become quite clear that uh, we need uh, measures uh, all the way throughout the life cycle from uh, raw materials extraction uh, to the production uh, of raw materials uh, going into plastic products, the manufacturing of plastic products, as well as uh, reducing consumption uh, and um, increasing uh, the, the environmental sound uh, uh, waste management uh, everywhere. So, uh, and I think there is broad consensus at this point uh, in the discussions uh, internationally concerning a global agreement uh, that a life cycle approach is needed um, and, um, and uh, a global agreement is important uh, to, to facilitate uh, a change in terms of uh, what measures uh, each country prioritizes uh, in this regard. Uh, throughout the process uh, of, um, of uh, identifying this as an emerging issue, we, uh, we have also um, requested UNEP to um, do an uh, analysis of the existing agreements um, that relates to uh, plastic pollution in some way. And uh, this was published in, in 2017, and it, um, it does identify a number of gaps in the existing uh, international frameworks. Uh, so in this table, you can see um, various uh, global instruments uh, that, that are targeted towards uh, plastic pollution in, in some relevant manner. Uh, but it's uh, it's clear from the from the table that land-based sources are largely unaddressed, and uh, that there's weak focus on upstream measures and uh, microplastic uh, microplastics is uh, completely missing. Um, while chemical additives only partially is addressed through existing mechanisms, but the, in in um, in total, this just all hinders uh, the international community for achieving a, a life cycle approach to plastics. So, uh, uh, and, and this table uh, provides also um, an additional um, projection to, to go along with that, uh, just um, analyzing the, the business as usual uh, compared uh, to the, the existing measures and current commitments and the the, the existing uh, global instruments that we have and shows that uh, all of the efforts that we've seen over the last few years will only um, have a 7% decrease uh, in the projected growth of plastic leaking into the oceans, uh, which is obviously uh, nowhere near enough. So I think um, these are uh, the most pressing um, points in terms of why we need a global agreement. Um, and uh, obviously, it all depends on, on the efficiency of the global agreements where, uh, where we are able to, um, to get in place. But Norway, uh, in addition to a whole host of other countries, are looking for a global agreement that can facilitate this system-wide change to plastics and, and move us towards a more circular plastics economy. Looking more into uh, the, uh, how an agreement could look like, uh, we've um, just uh, identified some possible strategic goals under uh, the objective of preventing plastic pollution. Um, which could, uh, this could be done in, in uh, a lot of uh, different ways. The, the, the main, uh, main uh, issue would be to, to identify a common uh, goal, common objectives, uh, and uh, um, uh, some underlying targets or strategic goals underneath there to, to uh, coordinate um, actions uh, at all levels by all actors. Uh, and I think uh, focusing on some of the more problematic and uh, also avoidable plastic products, such as, such as uh, a number of single-use products, 
which uh, has been proved to to end up to a large extent uh, in the environment um, is is uh, necessary to to prioritize and and to focus on and perhaps have more stringent measures targeted uh, to reducing the consumption of those products. But also, uh, we have a, a whole host of plastic products that are uh, at least uh, today essential to the functioning of our societies that, that we need to address um, and have a more sustainable management um, of, of those products and uh, looking into how those uh, products could be designed in a more um, more environmentally, uh, environmentally sound manner, being uh, able to recycle those products and, and keeping those resources in the loop, as well as focusing on, on sustainable waste management and uh, having um, parts of the world that doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure uh, to do that uh, today, uh, to be able to support those countries and uh, provide a, a common platform for learning and uh, exchanging of best experiences and so forth, uh, to, to really uh, get waste management uh, up and running uh, in those countries. Um, uh, the fourth is uh, the, the chemical hazard reduction strategic goal, which is uh, currently a major barrier to, to uh, uh, a circular economy of plastics, a uh, major barrier for recycling and uh, having uh, critical uh, impacts on both environment and potentially also human health uh, and well-being. So I think it's important uh, for us uh, to have a comprehensive approach um, going into all of these areas when we design uh, a new global agreement. Uh, we're uh, in terms of the the possible elements in a global agreement uh, in our thinking uh, the, it mainly consists of traditional elements for managing measures uh, assessing prog progress and results as well as supporting measures um, typically in uh, in multilateral uh, environmental agreements this would include then setting objectives and strategic goals but also establishing national action plans um, Norway just recently in August uh, announced our first uh, plastic plan, national plastic plan, taking a, a full life cycle approach uh, in that plan. Uh, we believe this could be um, a, a useful um, obligation uh, in, a, in an agreement. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, um, uh, reporting systems, mechanisms for monitoring environmental impacts, as well as providing financing and capacity building, uh, all uh, necessary elements, in our opinion, uh, in effective uh, global agreement. But also, there's a, as uh, has been said already, there's a, there's a lot that we don't know. We're uh, we're missing uh, a whole host of data on, on the material flows of plastic throughout our societies, both nationally and globally. And that uh, would uh, it um, prevents us from taking uh, more stringent actions and more targeted actions uh, at this point. So we do think that this should be looked at uh, as a framework agreement that can progress over time and take into account the, the knowledge generated by the reporting of national implementation and experiences as well as the, the scientific understanding of the impact on the environment and the efficiency of the, the measures that, that is going to be taken by, um, by governments. So uh, I think uh, having some, some um, elements that would, uh, would um, lead to a strengthening of the approach uh, over time is, is something we're also looking to to be a part of the agreement. Um, lastly, just uh, going into some of the potential benefits here. Um, let me see. There we go. Uh, we think there's a, a whole host of different benefits uh, for governments, for developing countries in particular, uh, for industry, 
uh, obviously for society as a whole. Uh, but the global coordination uh, of national actions through uh, the life cycle creates economic incentives uh, to businesses to make more sustainable products. I think this is uh, a critical point. Uh, I think this will, will reduce financial and physical burdens of waste management throughout uh, national economies. This is a, a very valuable uh, point, um, but also just uh, providing a, a toolbox of regulatory and market-based measures matched with uh, financial assistance and capacity building for developing countries. Uh, mm -hmm. The agreement will, will then ease implementation of effective national policies. Um, and lastly, just the harmonization of reporting and monitoring will inform us of global progress towards the goal of preventing plastic pollution, which we currently don't have. Um, so just a, a final point, the role of uh, the informal sector uh, in a more circular plastic economy is very important. Uh, we need to ensure a just transition. Um, and I'm glad to be part of this event and look forward to hearing more about the challenges and opportunities in this area to inform our uh, thinking going forward. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you um, very much, Erland. Um, for, for this very, very, very comprehensive overview of the state of negotiations and kind of the, the complexities of achieving these very strategic goals and ensuring that there's a process that um, overcomes some of the fragmentation uh, which we witnessed so far in you know, the existing treaties. And that's of course very, very challenging to achieve over very short time scales. Uh, and we can come back to some of the discussions, of course, later on. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and now I will uh, hand over to uh, Marianne Bailey um, from the Secretariat of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Um, please, uh, Marianne, um, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen at this? No, I don't think you can. Um, yes, we can see your screen. Ah, good. Yes, Absolutely. we can see your presentation. Good. Well, thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be with you today, and I appreciate the invitation from the organizers for us to be able to share our experience in addressing an informal sector in a multilateral environmental agreement. And we did that in the Minamata Convention on Mercury. And I actually think, although I'm happy to be proven wrong, I think it is the only MEA to explicitly address an informal sector. And we did that with a view to, to safeguard informal workers and their livelihoods, um, and also to have an opportunity to reduce their vulnerability by formalizing the conditions in which they work. Um, so just to, to show you how it all began, it began with science and data. Um, back in the early 2000s, there were a number of experts um, who knew that ASGM was among the largest uses uh, of mercury globally and sources of emissions of mercury globally. And as the data improved um, uh, between say 2000 and 2015, we actually found it to be the largest source of mercury uh, emissions globally surpassing even coal combustion. So uh, this, on the screen, you can see the data from, uh, it's 2015, the data that was reported in uh, 2018 Global Mercury Assessment, and it's pretty striking. So artisanal and small-scale gold mining uh, is the sec informal sector that we address, uh, and it addresses the sector uh, as it uses mercury amalgamation to extract gold from ore. Um, it's defined as gold mining conducted by individual miners or small enterprises with little capital investment and production. That's defined that way in our convention. Just to give you some history, um, going back to, to 2013, that's when we uh, finalized the text of the convention and it was signed at the diplomatic conference. Um, so those countries signing on agreed to work towards its objective of protecting human health 
and the environment for mercury. And we had entry into force in 2017. Um, but even before that, we started working on a lot of the procedures that would uh, allow parties to implement the convention, including um, discussion of guidance on uh, national action plans for ASGM. Uh, and the, that guidance was adopted at our first conference of the parties. So we now have 135 parties. And very quickly, just to show you the, the logic and, and structure of the convention, uh, it's got the control articles starting with um, trying to ratchet down the supply of mercury, which is an element, it can't be destroyed. So in, in a sense, it's, it's not strictly a life cycle approach because we're not trying to uh, put the element back into use in other ways. But it is a life cycle approach in that it looks comprehensively across all the stages of mercury extraction, uh, use, and waste management. Um, it's got the uh, supportive articles that really allow parties to, to make the convention work. And it's got support articles that support uh, their implementation, including a financial mechanism. So, uh, but even before we uh, finalized the text of the convention, and even before there was agreement to negotiate the text of the convention, there was um, a lot of scientific and ac not, I, I shouldn't say a lot, there was some scientific and academic research and project activity even before 2000. Um, and one in particular of note, the Global Mercury Project, which was a UNIDO run project that really got into artisanal mining communities and addressed this problem. It was quite groundbreaking. Um, and then there was the uh, UNEP Global Mercury Assessment in 2002, the first one that did uh, similar work to that pie chart I showed you earlier. Uh, and then there was um, a agreement because there was a strong push to address the global mercury issue. Um, there was agreement that partnerships could be one approach before countries were ready to negotiate a legally binding instrument. So in 2005, we had the first global mercury partnership meetings, um, and I was involved in those, and we had a very well attended uh, meeting on ASGM, and we called it the ASGM partnership area. Uh, it had a business plan that was agreed to by the multi-stakeholder group of partners. It had objectives, it had work priorities. Um, and most importantly, it recognized that ASGM is a critically important source of livelihoods for millions and millions of people throughout the world in over, at the time it was over 70 countries. Um, it's probably more like 80 now. Um, and and just like in the, the waste um, informal sector, it's uh, upwards of 20 million people working directly in the sector and many more who are in the communities that do this work. Um, in 2008, the governance structure for the Global Mercury Partnership was agreed. Um, and uh, there were seven partnership areas, including on ASGM, and that continues today. Um, the, the partnership has grown and evolved over time. There's over 200 multi-stakeholder partners, um, and it continues to be really active, including um, being involved in Jeff projects on Mercury. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I also want to point out that we had very, very strong collaboration with the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, and many other UN agencies and partners. So when we got to writing and negotiating and writing the text of the convention, uh, very early on, the, the negotiators agreed that um, we needed to address this informal sector specifically and uh, separately in the text. So not just as one element of, of many other uh, of the many substantive articles, but having its own article. Um, and uh, this was important to really define the, the unique approach taken by the convention. So the negotiators knew 
that it would be important to adopt a flexible approach based on country driven strategies and that the focus needed to be on formalizing the sector and protecting the mining communities and vulnerable populations. They, they, they knew also that avoiding a ban on mercury use in the sector um, would be important because uh, it, was, it was pretty widely agreed that a ban on mercury use in ASGM would simply drive the practice further underground and make it harder to get technical assistance solutions, technology improvements, health improvements to those communities. Uh, another thing that the text did was to delineate the worst practices in the sector. So uh, with a view that, over, that this problem wouldn't be solved overnight, um, it, there was a, a listing of worst practices that would really, really ratchet down um, the use and emissions, but also dramatically improve the health of the mining communities if simply those worst practices were eliminated. So uh, a cornerstone of the, uh, the approach taken uh, is national action plans. Uh, the convention calls for any uh, party that notifies the secretariat that ASGM using mercury in its territory is more than insignificant. I know that's kind of a strange terminology. Um, uh, if, if such a party notifies, then they are required to develop an ASGM national action plan um, with very specific requirements, but not only to develop the national action plan, but to implement it and to review it. Um, and so far, the Global Environment Facility has supported 43 countries in developing their national action plans. Uh, 16 of those have been completed and posted to our website. Many others are um, nearing completion. Um, I, I did want to point out, though, that when I mentioned that the negotiators agreed to not ban mercury use in ASGM, uh, I would say that uh, we've seen over time in the last few years since entry into force that a number of countries are doing just that. So that um, I think it remains to be seen if countries are really going to take, I, I guess I would call it sort of the easy way out to just put a ban on the books uh, and then say this sector has been addressed versus doing the really, really hard work of getting all the communities, all the stakeholders engaged in implementing these national action plans. So the, the national action plans are based on uh, our Annex C of the convention. The Annex C is it's about a page and a half of text of mandatory elements of the national action plans. So I won't go through it in great detail, but just um, the highlights, it includes country, countries reduction targets for the use uh, of mercury and ASGM. It includes the worst practices that I mentioned before, and those are whole or amalgamation, which uses lots and lots of mercury to amalgamate just the, the non-refined ore. Uh, open burning of amalgam, burning in residential areas, and then mixing of cyanide and mercury um, to extract the gold further. Uh, it includes uh, a push for baseline data. It includes formalization strategies. It includes trade because um, countries are getting a lot of uh, mercury coming into their borders that's not necessarily indicated for their um, for use in ASGM. Um, so they're very limited uh, in their ability to control that kind of trade. So the convention does have very specific trade provisions. Uh, the Annex C also focuses on vulnerable populations um, and then some optional additional strategies that 
that speak to the sort of the supply chain and the global marketing of the gold that emanates from ASGM, which is very substantial on the global market. So just to conclude, um, some of the tools that um, parties have at their disposal is our national action plan guidance. Again, that was uh, developed by the Global Mercury Partnership and UNEP. Uh, it was revised um, and considered by the, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. And then it was adopted at COP1 for use. Um, it was agreed at COP1 that it would be used, could be used by the parties. Uh, we are currently um, considering new sections on public health strategies that were developed by WHO and are already available to everyone to use uh, and on tailings management. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of financial um, support going to now, I think, 23 countries through the Planet Gold program, um, where uh, the push is to transition to mercury-free approaches, uh, to really push the idea of formalization, improve access to finance, um, to allow this cleaner gold to be uh, available on the global market in a, in a very transparent manner. Um, and then of course, awareness raising um, and getting lots of communities involved. The Planet Gold program has done a tremendous job on gender approaches, um, as well as knowledge management components and the knowledge management uh, component of those, that program is managed by UNEP. So um, hopefully that gives you a, a good glimpse of what we've done in the Minamata Convention, what we're still doing, and hopefully over time, uh, it will be proven to be a resounding success, which I hope that uh, the world will also see in the realm of plastics. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, very much, Mariana, for this excellent um, uh, presentation. and providing us a glimpse of the Minamata Convention and how that can be really informative in terms of the experience and process when we talk about something similar um, um, for the informal sector, but also plastic pollution, uh, especially when we think about is issues such as baseline data, the vulnerable po population, and, and the key word, of course, formalization, because that's you know, something very, very challenging, uh, of course, in different contexts. Um, yes, but um, again, thank you very much. This was uh, this was great. Um, and now um, I'll uh, hand over to um, Kabir Arora um, from the Alliance of Indian Waste Pickers um, to 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 provide a different perspective on um, uh, looking at the EPR and the informal sector. Um, so please, um, Kabir, um, go ahead. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Mar uh, Marianne, for a very nice presentation. It was very insightful for me, too. Um, it just gave a sense that there is an international environmental agreement where informal workers are included, so that's an enlightening thing, which uh, I was not aware of. And, and I would also like to propose an internal discussion to learn about that treaty, uh, that convention. Now, coming to the... Um, uh, to the question of EPR work, my presentation is uh, going to be about the, the work which we have done on multilayered plastic in India. And then what is the current discourse on EPR within the waste pickers organization and as well as nationally and policy wise. So first part, when I'm talking about uh, the MLP experience, the current, um, so we have some work which is going on with ITC and SWACH in Pune. And similarly, United Nations Development Program is involved with, uh, in the Circular Economy Initiative is involved with the plastic waste management in India. And a part, substantial part of it is, uh, part of it is to deal with the multi-layered plastic, which itself is a, uh, which is a major challenge. So, if you look at within the plastic domain, we have uh, uh, materials which have high, which can be recycled at a better. Uh, uh, you you can recycle it at a high rate. Then there are materials which go down cycling. There are materials which are like multi-layered plastic, which do not have any form of recycling. So that's something where we wanted the emphasis of 
EPR to be. And in some states, in some places, there are volunteer engagements, which the private corporations, private companies are engaged either through multilateral institutions like United Nations Development Program or directly with the Wastepickers organizations. So far, the experience has been very interesting. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, it's still, we are still establishing the norms of the game. And uh, there are some challenges which have emerged in past few years, and there is some uncertainty in the political environment in terms of, of the policies on EPR and how it will impact the current system. So right now we have uh, the set of challenges which we are facing in that space is, 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 the is the question of fair remuneration, the costs are still not being covered. The, the only engagement which we have for multi-layered plastic is largely to send it for co-processing in cement kilns, which is not a very environment-friendly option current right now. But that's the only uh, choice we have. There is some level of subsidization which happened at the level of municipal corporations in some places, not all. Uh, by providing space or having some sort of arrangement in place to, to ensure that uh, this material is going. Involving of waste pickers organization by the, the private companies is also an uh, appreciation of the fact that waste pickers know the supply chains better and they know how to take forward, uh, take this system forward and sort of, they have the nuances of where, where to send the material, they have access to material, they have transportation system in place and they have, um, they have support of municipality to aggregate at some place. Then we, when we look at the wider discussion, um, it's still not there of what our aspiration is within the APR system. The, the recycling of multilayered plastic is still challenged because there is lack of policy, uh, policy prescription about the matter. Now coming to the EPR discourse in India, um, the, we have been, uh, in, uh, so in 2011, the government of India uh, made plastic waste management rules, which were largely, uh, for the first time, which were largely the single use plastic, uh, waste material, uh, plastic material rules, we can call them. After that, there was a vision to have, there was a vision to have uh, solid waste management as well as plastic waste management in the extended and having a sort of system for EPR in those two, two domains. And then there was um, there was uh, this SOP, uh, these standard operating procedures were put in place. There was some sort of registration of producer responsibility organizations, which has happened, which involved a lot of waste picker organizations to be registered as producer responsibility organization to do the EPR work. And then we had some uh, sort of uh, national uh, rules, the draft guidelines came in picture, the first draft, and there was an outline of involving waste pickers in the form of waste management agency, and there was some space uh, in the form of producer responsibility organization. Currently, the current draft the government has put out again, and the issue which we have with the current draft is that it is completely out of touch with uh, the reality, the reality of the plastic waste management in India. And now when I say India particularly, it's not just India. The, the, across the global south, the extended producer responsibility frameworks are still inconsiderate of what is going on in the plastic waste management and, and uh, plastic waste recycling. Some countries like South Africa have taken initiatives where you have policy prescription of what can be done. The Brazil, we have a very thorough extended producer responsibility framework, which is in place, but it is a voluntary system. It is not a mandatory system and waste pickers have been engaging with it and having some sort of arrangement with private corporations to cover the cost which they are incurring. But it's still not the best system, but it is still a functional system which, which exists in these places. Now, uh, what is the key asks at India level and what are the key asks at the international level, which I will be sharing. So at India level, what we are looking at is that the solid waste management rules, the government, the legislation, sub subordinate legislation, which is framed to, to, to manage the sector and ensure that uh, there is some sort of guidelines on how, how the systems work. So what we have is there is a very strong prescription of integration of waste pickers. And this, was, this became possible because the, the government involved waste pickers organizations to be a part of the committee itself, which was 
is framing these rules. And then we had, uh, then we worked with the, the national system, the, the government's think tank, National Institute of Urban Affairs and a couple of other institutions within the government to create an ecosystem for the, uh, for the integration of waste pickers in the process, whether training the municipal authority officials or, um, or critiquing the policy itself and helping the government to nuance its understanding on how, how we will have issues with whatever language uh, we are speaking, uh, whatever language is prescribed, some of the pitfalls of the document. So, so we did some of this work. And what happened in last uh, six months, we were a little disappointed that one side, there was a strong mandate for involving a waste picker and suddenly we have a draft document, which is completely exclusionary, which does not consider the needs of the informal sector. And now when I say India is not just the only one, there are many countries who have the similar issues where the rules have been drafted. And something very important, which has happened, the plastic waste management rules are drafted with the lens of hazardous waste or with the lens of uh, waste which is very difficult to manage uh, something uh, which 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 is worrying because not all plastic waste is hazardous and uh, and not all plastic is hazardous and they are framed in the line on the lines of what we have for electronic waste management now the, uh, the electronic waste management question, I'm just keep uh, just giving a reflection there, is the electronic waste management rules are unimplemented. And one of the reasons why they're, they're not very well implemented because they do not catch up with the current state of recycling by the informal sector. And the government of India's own reports, including some of the reports of the advisors to the government have stated that 75 to 75% um, above to 90% of waste is uh, being recycled by the informal sector. And if you look at uh, the report of the experts, it's 85% of waste material within electronic waste is non-hazardous and can easily be recycled. Now, if the lens of electronic waste is used to plastic waste management, it will cause a lot of harm, irrespective of the fact that even those rules are inconsiderate of the reality. So, uh, so this is why it becomes very important to have involvement of waste pickers and informal sector when framing the policy discourse. Second thing, what we have been asking is that if you look at it, largely high waste plastic material, highly recyclable plastic material is, is, the, is uh, pet bottles and other things, and they're already being recycled. A lot of focus in the wider EPR discourse currently is going on to deal with the high value material and not with what we are facing the issue with, which is the multi-layered plastic, which is the, the compostable plastic, which is now in the market and many other forms. So, that, uh, so our focus has been, uh, let's reduce the focus on high value and focus first on, on the bigger issue, which is, which is the, uh, the low value and the uh, multi-layered plastic. Now, the key ask which waste pickers are asking, uh, which waste pickers are making across the world. One, we need a mandatory EPR system, uh, which is, it should not be voluntary because voluntary, uh, the spirit of volunteerism is not there as such. There are people doing good work, but we need overall mandatory with government participation. Second thing which we are asking for is the co-production of EPR system, like the policy framework, which was done in India's case with solid waste management and plastic waste management rules. And some of the other policies which have come on waste management. Second is the, uh, the collection and transportation and other form of processing should involve waste pickers organizations and there should be fair remuneration for that. Currently, what we are looking at is just the focus on collection. We, uh, waste pickers are robust, but we have other actors in informal recycling industry who have an important role to play. So there should be a wider ecosystem perspective and not just alone focusing on waste pickers because waste pickers on their own can't change the system and then invest in infrastructure. The other thing which we are asking for is that uh, there should be general knowledge of the toxicity of material available to, to understand what is, so that when one is working on recycling, the workers are clear, uh, uh, are, are understanding that they are using this material and they should be careful. So now at the end, I will also say that we, we need standard setting in the sector, in the engagement on EPR with the informal, informal uh, waste economy. And I would like to invite the institution like ICAP to help us and also learn, explore uh, the status of integration of waste pickers uh, 
in current EPR system? And what is the aspiration of informal sector at large so that it can guide the discourse on plastics treaty? And EPR is just one tool within the plastics treaty. There are multiple other aspects where waste pickers need to be integrated. So let's have a holistic approach to the process. And it will be nice to have a status report on something, what is the scale of recycling by the informal sector in plastic waste management, which we have some data, but now we have new projects, which we are, we are specific to extended producers responsibility. What is the role of informal sector and how it has been? So there are general ambiguous discussions like formalization and other things. I won't like to go in that, but I will say that for now, the discussion on formalization is very ambiguous and vague. We need to define, set the standards for the sector. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Kabir, for this very, very engaging talk and actually providing this perspective, which comes from more the ground realities and how we can actually design uh, or, or what, are the, what are the missing points in the policies, if it's with EPR or plastic waste management rules, that simply don't acknowledge how the realities, you know, what realities there exist. And I think uh, for anything to work really when we talk about policy or conventions is that these realities are assessed and understood uh, quantitatively or qualitatively or a combination of both. And that's, you can't have a success, successful process otherwise. So that's extremely important to highlight. So thank you so much, Kabir. And, and in fact, that's uh, actually a good start for our next speaker um, who will talk uh, a little bit more about uh, his work in terms of the methodologies uh, when it comes to assessing and understanding the ecosystem of the informal sector with, with the focus on work um, in India, but also internationally. And uh, Siddharth, uh, please keep it uh, to try to keep it to 10 minutes. Uh, we are you know, tight on time, as is the case with the webinars such as this. Um, but please, uh, Siddharth, um, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. Um, very engaging talk. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm very, very happy to be here. Let me just figure out if I can present this. Okay. Can, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Um, so, so, okay. So my, my background is I'm a data scientist by training. Um, I worked in the development sector for a number of years where my goal was really to collect data in hard to collect environments uh, from, from uh, poor settlements, from, uh, from like, you know, areas where there's no Wi-Fi or, or mobile internet and things like that. And <clears throat> I've always kind of been really fascinated about the informal supply chain. So I live in Chennai, which is a city in South of India. It's the fourth largest city. I think we have about 8 million people here. And I grew up living very close to the beach. Um, so in college, uh, you know, us and a bunch of people, we started organizing these beach cleanups. Um, and uh, we used to do it every week. Um, the beach was very dirty. Um, and it was really there that we noticed uh, waste pickers coming and picking up certain kinds of material. And I was really fascinated, fascinated with why they pick up specific things versus something else. And also kind of where, where do they sell it? You know, what happens to that material, things like that. Um, in 2015, and uh, we won a grant from the World Economic Forum to kind of map the informal supply chain in, 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 in Chennai, my hometown. Um, and my goal actually was at that time when I was applying, I, I felt that there was a lot of academic kind of knowledge and understanding about the waste picker as a stakeholder group. But, you know, my lived experience in Chennai and a lot of lived experience of, of people in, in living in Indian cities is that you have this local scrap shop uh, close to your house who's buying different kinds of material. When you drive out the city, you see these larger kind of like scrap shops and things like that. So I was really interested in mapping the supply chain and kind of understanding what happened. Um, so that's kind of how we started Kabadi Wala Connect. Kabadi Wala Connect now is a social enterprise with a for-profit business. But our goal is really to kind of holistically integrate and leverage this informal supply chain, really thinking of the informal supply chain as infrastructure for cities in the global south. Um, so the starting point is this question of informality, right? And we need to kind of have a reality check here, which is, is an ILO study which says that 2 billion people, that 60% of the world's employed population, work in the informal economy. So this isn't some fringe conversation of, you know, kind of social, you know, hey, how do we work with, you know, this very marginalized, it's actually supply chains. And, and a lot of, of stakeholders 
you know, in different kinds of supply chains in the global south actually work informally, quote unquote. And I think the biggest, the biggest effect that that has on, on people is that site and labor, like compliance and issues are just not really addressed. I don't, I think when people talk formalization, they always think about it as like, okay, you know, we should tax them or they should be a registered shop or things like that, things that might, you know, have a detrimental effect to people who are not making that much money. But really the biggest issue I think of people who work in the informal supply chain are like how they live their day-to-day -day lives, you know, how they have to choose between their, their health and, and, and making money. Um, when I, when in, the, in the academic research also, you know, when we were, you know, before we did this mapping in Chennai, something that we knew was that there was already a lot of literature out there that kind of is doing these studies on the informal supply chain, talking about economic benefits. You know, folks say that, you know, they, not just how much they collect and how active they are in like, you know, in material val valorization, but even to go as far as try to put a number of how much it actually helps save municipalities and things like that. Um, some big numbers that were kind of interesting, of course, is, you know, there's an estimation that there's in India, for example, there's 1.5 million waste pickers. And there were different studies that were kind of est estimating that this supply chain was collecting about 20% of the recycl recyclable materials in a city. And that's a huge number. Um, and of course, they are saving some money for the municipality. That's kind of, there was studies about that. And of course, we know that the waste pickers really getting the worst deal out of participating in this kind of important supply chain. Um, one of the things that we focused on, and again, you know, my lived experience walking around, cycling around Chennai, you see these small scrap shops, these larger guys, was that in the academic literature, there's so much focus on the waste picker. And kind of just to illustrate, we kind of, this is a, this is a wordle where, and, and this is kind of an estimation of different class, or what people talk about when they speak about the informal supply chain. We can agree on waste picker, not really because in a lot of people, in a lot of cases, they're talking about the waste because a collector or a waste hyphen picker or an itinerant buyer. Uh, but then when it comes to aggregators, there's really a lot of like ambiguity. Either you're a wholesaler, a scrap dealer, a, a, you know, a, a what what middlemen, you know. So, so I think that for me, the real goal was I wanted to kind of map the entire supply chain in Chennai. That was our goal. Uh, just walk every street, uh, map every stakeholder and really try to build a bottom-up vision a, a kind of like view of like what the supply chain was in the city of Chennai. Um, and, and hopefully also through that, try to, through their function in the supply chain, try to really look at how you can begin to classify them in a, in a streamlined way, something that would move from Indian city to Indian city, but also maybe now we're seeing a lot of similarities in the supply chain in India and Indonesia, for example. So really maybe a South to South, global South, kind of perspective of functions in the informal supply chain. So ultimately, our, you know, we want to grant from the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data and our final report of mapping the informal sector in India was, uh, was uh, you know, kind of published there. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but the fact was that we mapped about 2,500 stakeholders. We found three very clear kinds of people, uh, waste pickers who pick up material at no input cost, roaming the city or on a cycle. They sell to the small scrap shop, what we call level one aggregators, who are material agnostic, um, and they, they buy different kinds of materials. Their primary feedstock comes from waste pickers, but also local residents that they, that they are kind of nearby. And then you have these larger kind of larger aggregators, what we call level two aggregators, who are kind of more like material recovery facilities, doing some pre-processing and things like that. This is a map of what we found in Chennai. We didn't do a complete mapping of waste because we mapped about 300, over 300 of them. Um, but we did a comprehensive mapping of the level one and level two aggregators that we found in Chennai. And again, here, this is for me, is just like an amazing map where you can actually, when you look at it, this zoom out at the city level, it forces you to think of the informal sector's infrastructure you know, and one of the things that we found was that they were collecting 130,000 tons of material every uh, every year. So that's 20 over 20 percent, 24 percent or something what Chennai generates. So if that was a formal contract, that's a multi-million dollar contract, except that these guys are kind of entrepreneurial. They have their own networks. They're very decentralized in how they kind of approach things. So, you know, for us, again, I think the key features of level zero, level one, level two, and again, with Diva, we're really interested to kind of do this mapping in Surat as well to see how this works. We have a strong suspicion that you're going to see waste pickers, small scrap shops who are material agnostic, and these larger scrap shops who are more specialized in what they do and operate more like material recovery facilities. 
Um, and again, just one, one data point on how, you know, just from a pricing, this, and this is kind of the data driven side of things, you know, where this is based on three months worth of data, where you can see clearly based on who you were, who you're talking to and the kind of role and function that they were playing. Waste pickers going out and picking up plastic, in this case, it's PET. Um, they have no storage space. So they sell to a level one aggregator. All the ones in red are, are small guys. So they have between 500 to 2000 square foot of space. These are the folks who are in the cities and have the key little agnostic. And then you kind of have the level two guys and you see these price jumps based on what they do. Um, and level two, really, they start pre-processing and, and doing very specific things for the formal sector. Um, from our perspective, you know, as a for-profit company, and this may be the last couple of slides, uh, we work heavily on the, we provide solutions in the enumeration space, so really mapping these supply chains, rapid mapping, rapid assessment, material flows, et cetera, et cetera. We work a lot on the procurement guarantees and the digitalization, also the traceability space. Um, and the social protection really is really trying to leverage private, public kind of things that are already out there, like so health insurance, for example, for, for ultra poor. That's already a package. You need to kind of then map that towards the profile of a waste picker or a level one aggregator. But ultimately, we believe that these small scrap shops and these waste pickers can really be leveraged by the municipality to organize like municipal waste collection. And that's when you actually solve this really big issue of waste pickers going out to dump sites and, and dump yards and really choosing you know, between health and livelihood. Um, yeah, again, you know, from what we read academically, you know, see, I think my final point is, I think in the global south, waste management is really expensive. There's a World Bank study which says that just to collect everything and put it to the landfill, it can cost the municipality anywhere between 20 to 50% of its budget. So for us, we see this informal supply chain as decentralized infrastructure that can really come in and solve these pain points on collection and, and segregation and things like that. Um, and yeah, and just maybe as a final point, very, very excited about potentially this, this, this learning from this mapping experience in Suez and kind of applying these principles. You know, we're very excited about Neva's approach. It's very fresh. I think that this scientific and data-driven approach is missing where, you know, there's a lot of kind of like uh, policy that's not really data-driven. So I think that that's going to be a key differentiator if we are to kind of really map this kind of circular economy approaches, this issue of marine plastic towards your uh, sustainable development goals. Thank you. Yes. Thank you um, so much, uh, Siddharth, and, um, um, and, 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 and I, I'm always very fascinated by the work that you do and the kind of filling a, a space that needs to be filled in terms of actually uh, providing a certain kind of data and a certain kind of digitalization um, of, 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 of the value chains that exist, which right now is a little bit of a black spot, uh, but which is very, very important uh, when we actually try to get to a baseline of what is happening from a more quantitative perspective as well. Um, yes, and I think um, our next speaker, um, Costas, um, is actually uh, probably quite nicely fitting as a follow-up here um, um, with his presentation um, from an from a, from a, from a academic perspective and from a, from, a, from a mapping perspective, a networking perspective. Um, so please, uh, Costas, go ahead. Um, and I would just uh, like to remind our speakers, we go maybe a little bit over time. So we understand that some of you may have to leave at um, 3.30, but given um, you know, the ex excellent um, uh, presentations here, I invite you to stay on for a few more minutes for a little bit of discussion. Um, thank you very much, Costas, um, for being here. And please go ahead. Thank you uh, so much, Hans, for in inviting me. Um, uh, I'm not sure you're able to see the right screen. Can you confirm that's um, the case? Yes, we can uh, see your PowerPoint. It's a full PowerPoint, excellent. Um, it's uh, not the full PowerPoint, but it's the slides, you know, in the program. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to, um, again. Um, but we can see the first is that, slide. Is that yeah, now correct? Can... Yes, great. Excellent, sorry, I have two screens here. It's a bit complicated for me. I don't know how Zoom does this. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, so much heartened and thrilled by today's um, event. And um, of course, uh, on our route to uh, UNIA 5.2 and the, the prospect of a new global treaty, um, we really have to ensure that uh, all the key partners and stakeholders are included. And uh, this invitation, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm an academic, but also I've been uh, working on the informal sector for many years to uh, 
uh, also <laughs> contributed in academic and it was interesting to see our paper we published some almost 16 years was seminal to, to start putting um, the sector on, on, on the global agenda. So yes, we, we work from the laboratory to modeling to uh, global benchmarking on waste and circular economy and focused a lot on the informal recycling and developing quantification and benchmark tools for uh, evidence across the world. Last years focusing a lot on, on plastics pollution. So uh, work cuts across those, those, those aspects very interestingly. For example, uh, when we have developed the Waste Aware Cities benchmark indicators a few years ago, uh, we, we put the uh, work of the uh, informal recyclers, collectors, and sorters at the heart of it uh, that hasn't been measured really uh, uh, before. But also we um, led the development of the integration radar toolkit a few years ago that looked at the um, uh, uh, integration, inclusion, formalization. There are many different terms, many nuances here, but uh, efforts to improve the, the livelihoods and maintain uh, uh, and enable the, the sector at, at, uh, at the heart of, of this. And we're happy that this has been applied across the world. Uh, rightly so, when we're trying to understand uh, what is the role of the informal recycling sector, waste pickers, or call it uh, uh, as you want on the entire supply chain, we cannot see them in, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, alone. We have to see them in association on a whole system of material flows. Um, and uh, uh, as it has been rightly said, uh, for instance, this is an example in Mumbai in India. I was really thrilled to see the, the very interesting uh, 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 data about Chennai, um, it's, it's, it's uh, um, part of a complex ecosystem that have to be considered that increasingly you're going to higher level of formality and eventually feeding the material into the formal industry, which is, is very interesting. And there is value appropriation issues as has been explained on the ability to uh, uh, retain and gain value from the resources. We have been also working in Brazil and we've been mentioned about the EPR uh, efforts there trying to uh, describe this ecosystem and describe how this value appropriation is happening. Uh, because the problem we're having is a lack of trust between the different parts of the sector, formal and formal, the state, and so on. So uh, in our effort to create these win-win situations, we developed the Solidarity Selective Collection Toolkit that um, tries to, uh, if you like, um, demonstrate how the informal sector is operating in the wider ecosystem and what value is offering and uh, um, that's really important, both on monetized value, but also value that's hard to monetize, like, uh, um, for instance, carbon savings on uh, uh, and uh, uh, preventing climate change. So the challenges and the opportunities around waste pickers and formal recycling sector across the global south are really not new. They are involved in different capacities, as you've seen. Uh, but not least in, uh, uh, in providing collection services in informal settlements, collection of recyclables, plastics are a key one, but also in sorting uh, uh, and delivering some value. But now is reframed under a circular economy and plastics pollution agenda. And uh, I've written an editorial a few years ago, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but there are loads and loads of challenges. So yes, loads of opportunities, but also uh, not an easy topic to make uh, progress on the ground, but a topic that we have to make progress on the ground. Now, the plastics pollution, uh, uh, and I'm borrowing our work here from the uh, International Solid Waste Association's Task Force on Marine Litter, uh, is a complex issue. Is dispersed sources, pathways, and sinks, and linking local to global. And how the informal sector is linked to that, were um, we, our work, uh, recent work in the Royal Academy of Engineering, and uh, thank you, um, uh, um, uh, the uh, Deputy Director of, of, of NORAD for quoting our numbers. Uh, we dare to do some estimates of the global contribution of the informal recycling sector. Um, and that's a middle number. And these are conservative estimates, as you can see, because they're based on a number of uh, average number of 11 million waste pickers across the world. And I, I think you, you can see it in, in different ways. So it's, it's a conservative estimate that are almost responsible for 60% of all the plastics collected for recycling across the world. So this becomes obviously uh, 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 so important because there could be no solution forward in mitigating 
the global challenge of plastics pollution and enabling a circular economy of plastics across the world without the contribution of the waste pickers. It's a no brainer. It's not gonna happen. It wouldn't have been happening without them. And that's why you're proposing uh, uh, that uh, they should be really enabled in a real way as a major preventive measure and uh, also, um, uh, um, uh, but of course this contributes to many other SDGs that I don't have the time to go along now from poverty elimination uh, to the SDG 12 and, and, and so on. Now, uh, we have now reframed all this work because uh, we are really trying to produce new global, uh, local to global tools, modeling tools that quantify plastics pollution, help us dissect and understand what is happening. And in order to uh, do really that, we um, have to take holistic approaches. So these are some of the four tools that um, my research team led or was, uh, had a key role in developing at the University of, of Leeds and you can find more information online. But I would like really to start from the uh, uh, predictions that were mentioned before about the business as usual scenario with the current commitments, for example, that deliver very little improvement indeed. Uh, uh, the work that was done uh, for the uh, 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 Pure Charitable Trust and Systemic, and our team was responsible for core part of this modeling. And as you see, put in form of collection sorting explicitly into uh, the, the heart of it and quantified it because without it, uh, it, it wouldn't be possible to analyze this um, uh, um, global um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, the role is super important. And that was the first global effort on a circular uh, coupled uh, plastic pollution model that quantified the role of the informal recycling sector and stressed the importance uh, the results do so. Now we are in a position to move ahead to much more sophisticated estimation of how the world is managed across the world. And our, our new model um, uh, spot, which is gonna be released soon, and we released already some preliminary results into the uh, Global Marine uh, Litter Partnership of United uh, Nations Environment, is gonna be a really uh, provide us a new base about the contribution of the informal sector in preventing plastics pollution across the world. And of course, that's really important to take it into account when we're quantifying um, the SDG indicators and uh, keep an eye on, on that because uh, um, yes, these efforts are, are gonna give us some evidence, but also we are have huge uncertainties, uh, rightly so. Informal sector is something that it doesn't really uh, uh, document it and that makes it a core part of its informality. So that's why it's important to uh, move decisively into that direction. Uh, for example, when we use the other tool that we developed, the plastic pollution calculator, which is a very detailed toolkit to understand and quantify plastics pollution from uh, uh, macro uh, uh, pollutants, ma macro plastics across the world, uh, the conceptual framework explicitly takes into account the informal sector. And what we have found from the application in this case studies across the world is that it's very difficult. The authorities don't take it into account even if we have a very active informal sector and there is an educational capacity development process when you're applying the tools to make them understand what is happening to uh, make their role visible, which is, is very important. And then they start realizing this, that's something important is happening here. Then um, I'm really happy that uh, some comments in the chat and uh, uh, touched upon also, um, and, but also the EPR uh, presentation uh, uh, touched upon the uh, changes in, in, in the Basel Convention, which were led with good intentions by, by Norway. And, and, and uh, uh, we have raised the importance of this many years ago when nobody wanted to listen that the global supply chain of secondary plastics of plastic recycled across the world dependent on China it wasn't sustainable. And there were all sorts of problems across it. We're now in a different um, situation like that because this, these global flows are controlled, but the reality remains that uh, most of it, it was going to China because it was uh, low, cheap and non-controlled and then other industrialized states across Southeast Asia and now most in Turkey, Turkey with similar problems then a lot of these activities actually are conducted by the informal sector also, all this uh, sorting, and they're exposed to all sorts of risks, 
but also are opportunities for improvement here. Now, the recent work that uh, you've seen the data uh, from uh, about the contribution of the plastic uh, uh, towards plastic recycling uh, from the informal recycling sector came from a work we have conducted for the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK. And uh, part of this also um, was around safety. Uh, and we revealed that um, actually uh, child workers, women and uh, uh, workers, informal workers in general, are the most exposed to all sorts of hazards. A lot of those hazards also come from the proximity of the open burning which is the other aspect of plastic pollution. And we shouldn't really miss the opportunity for this global treaty to try and um, treat the, the risks come from the open burning of the waste, which means it won't end up in the water, but it would really cause other severe damage to the public health and the planet also through climate change. So keep an eye on the evidence on that because we will keep publishing stuff, but uh, the evidence is actually overwhelming is overwhelming on the role, the prevent the role that uh, uh, the uh, uh, recycling sector, informal recycling sector is currently playing uh, towards plastics pollution, but also on their extremely vulnerable position. They are not least on their health, they're vulnerable socially as well. And that's why we have proposed actually standardized reporting methods, um, establishing global observatory to facilitate targeted intervention and designs and, and so on. So, I'm really heartened by the ICAP launch today that is actually absolutely spot on and hopefully will be complementing other initiatives. And as I uh, have spent my whole career trying to generate meaningful data, data that is hard to obtain and also enable an evidence-based uh, action, I think the uh, UNIA 5.2 and the Global Treaty Prospect is really a, a very important a milestone that we shouldn't, as a global community, miss and formal recycling sector should be is part, part of the solution because it's core part of the preventive reality. We need to work closer to uh, do the evidence gap uh, and uh, 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 made that understood, but also uh, fill that gap. And also, uh, however, move into enabling, uh, uh, collecting materials that are more hard to collect, but also uh, boosting circularity, but improving livelihood and maintaining and even exp expanding and supporting livelihoods. Uh, we have to do that in an evidence base and without oversimplifying these issues are highly debated, contested, and are sometimes hard to address. We shouldn't underestimate the failures of the past. For example, the fam failures to enable the waste pickers um, in, in, in many parts of the world, despite money and efforts that have been put for decades. And hopefully we'll arrive to win-win situations across sectors and stakeholders. And the treaty will be a, a, a core initiative indicating uh, the pathway to that. And we're really here to work with across all the stakeholders for evidence-based solutions that really enable the humans who dedicate so much effort solving and not creating the problem. So thank you. And I look forward to the discussion and the ongoing debate towards the treaty. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Costas, for this very, very uh, inspiring macro level picture, uh, summarizing so much of research that you have been engaged with and connecting it to the current discourse. I mean, this was, this was great. Um, and I like the fact um, when you mentioned, for instance, I mean, a colleague of mine uh, who's maybe also here in the webinar mentioned recently, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of attention on marine litter um, but um, there's also a lot of area litter, you know, when it comes to open burning, when it comes to the health effects um, from the interlinkages between plastics and pops uh, releases. Um, so there's so many aspects to consider and there's so much more. I mean, there's a lot of evidence base that has been established and converting that now into something that actually improves the, the lives uh, of, of, of people who work in the sector, uh, but also ensuring better environmental conditions in general is just, you can't overstate uh, the, the urgency for it right now. Uh, and of course, ECAP um, is very happy and I think very much in, in, in coherence with, with the, you know, what you, uh, what, with your closing words in terms of providing this uh, space for the scientific community to come together and for other stakeholders to actually uh, push for some real change. So that was very, very nice. 
Um, now we are already uh, a few minutes over time, but I can still see actually that the participants have stayed on. I think which also is testimony to the uh, the, 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 the quality of this uh, of the presentations and the, and the speakers. Um, but um, uh, we shouldn't probably take too long. But I, I'm quickly looking to the comments and maybe we have some quick reflections. Um, maybe Luca, you will, uh, if you would want to say something in the beginning, there was some questions on, on, on ECAP and the purposes. Maybe you can- Yes, of course. Yes. Um, I caught my attention one of the comment that was very pertinent about what, what's the meaning of ECAP. There are already many other fora, many other uh, groups uh, of uh, debate. What makes ECAP unique is this is the initiative of science. Uh, those fora that exist are often multi-actor fora. There is a, they take place at a local, regional, or global level. So at each level, the point of view of different stakeholders are uh, assimilated and brought forward to the next level. So for example, during the negotiation for an international agreement, uh, there would be different different stakeholders and different states will bring their position that also need to safeguard the point of view and their interest, for example, of private actor, like a formal private actor, like a industry, et cetera. So in this context, you can imagine the plastic industry has a value, global value of 600 billion euro and it employs millions of people uh, around the world. Uh, their point of view will certainly be listened, but do does the scientific community has a strong, a strong visibility? What is our strength to bring our position? We believe that the scientific perspective should be placed forward clearly in a cohesive and strong way. And we think that there was a need for something like ECAP that uh, create uh, this cohesive voice for among scientists working across discipline uh, it's not just about measuring microplastic as I do in many of my projects, but I'm here actually to say that we need to, to join forces and develop a cohesive scientific work, which also include analyzing socioeconomic systems and uh, value network, including the one of the informal sector. So that is scientific research in this area. So, and I think the ECAP is the home to create visibility and give uh, uh, an impact to the scientists scientists that works independently and free of conflict of interest. So I hope uh, this uh, explain uh, how we see our mission here. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. I think that um, was, was pretty much on, 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 the, on the spot. And uh, I think our collaboration, I mean, I'm a very much social scientist. You're very much from a natural science background and working together is, a good <laughs> example in practice of how yeah. uh, the problem generates a drive um, to, to, to work together uh, from very different vantage points, um, which is of course also something uh, which I can see from this webinar here because all the speakers come from very different vantage points, uh, very different backgrounds, uh, but with the, with the common aim. Uh, and bringing that together is, is not so easy. It sounds very easy sometimes, but in practice it's not. Um, and I think that's uh, something that uh, needs to needs to uh, become more cohesive, uh, if, if I can put it that way. Um, and maybe we can just quickly, I mean, there was one, um, I mean, I think Kabir, you responded to uh, Maria's question uh, about, because one of the key issues, and that's, it's, it's, it's a very, very long running debate when it comes to the question of formalization. Uh, and there's, I um, mean, for instance, we talked about Mumbai and India and the, the, the state, because the state doesn't see the informal sector. It, 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 it doesn't, uh, you know, it's very hard to work with something that you don't formally recognize. Uh, and it's very hard to work with something where there's oftentimes, uh, you know, a convenience uh, where exclusion or exclusionary uh, principles are very much part of the fundament of, of, of the state approach towards the sector. Uh, and changing that is, of course, a very, you know, it's a very political economy kind of question, you know, of, of, of how can you change the power between, you know, a sector and the, uh, and the state. Um, and maybe, I mean, um, uh, Kabir, because that's, you know, I think this is one of the core questions, of course, here as well. I mean, maybe if you briefly want to respond to that question. 
Um, just to look at how do, how, for I was also answering that question in the message. It's the work of organizing, which, uh, which also helps not just in participation in the system itself, but also it makes us resilient it, uh, for the other shocks which we keep facing because of the informal nature of the work. So that, that's my, my fundamental point, because even in, we have cases like Mumbai, where women's organized, women's waste pickers organizations have set, uh, are managing dry waste, dry waste collection centers, where you have aggregation of recyclable plastic. And these are the places which are managed. So there is a participation thanks to the organizing work and we do see the outcome. And that's the, the key to, to this process. It is always nice to, to learn what the, what the scholars have to say about waste pickers, but it, it, we are also trying to build a leadership within the system that they can speak for themselves in these spaces to negotiate those things directly themselves. So that's part of the organizing work. Thank you very much, um, Kabir. Um, yes, and um, I think, um, I mean, there's two things which I would like to, to, to mention in, in, in closing. Uh, one thing is that, um, I mean, this, this discussion and this debate does not end with the webinar here. Um, the, the material will be made uh, available. Uh, and also we plan to follow up with this um, uh, webinar series, uh, with the discussions. Uh, and also have written uh, output uh, that we plan to um, uh, disseminate uh, in, in close coordination with the panelists uh, who have been here today, as well as with the comments from the from the from the uh, participants. Um, so this is a, a continuing process that is not ending, you know, after 3:45 in 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 Oslo time. Um, so this is continuing. Um, and um, uh, thank you um, uh, for, for the excellent presentations and the quality of, 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 of ensuring the quality of this webinar that it's actually useful and meaningful and that um, people have actually taken away something from this, including myself. Um, and I would like to close with just um, inviting um, my close uh, collaborators who have been uh, involved in organizing the webinar, as well as uh, having played a key aspect in setting up the ECAP um, uh, webpage. Um, so maybe if uh, Emmy Nöcklebier, um, Caroline Enge, and um, yeah, Martina is already there on the, on the screen, uh, can um, 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 briefly open up their their windows uh, or their videos. And um, yeah, so great job, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for putting this actually together. I know I'm the, I'm the visible one, but you guys did a lot of hard work. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, and um, also I would like to thank um, Maria and Grit Arendal and Salt and Mugama Consultants who have also been very, very crucial in putting this together and will also continue to be, of course, part of the ECA project. Um, so, Yes, with this, I, I, I wind up for the day and, um, um, and, and we will stay in touch. And that's the whole point of the ECUP uh, Knowledge Hub as well, that we have this forum to keep in touch uh, and to, to, to do something uh, more concrete and good with it. Um, yes, so have a good um, evening, uh, afternoon or, or morning. Some, some of you are even there from the East Coast uh, in the US, so great. Have a, have a good day and thank you. Thank you so much.